Uh, Community Matters here on Think Tech. I'm Jay Fadel. We're going to remember Westlock today. Westlock is a story that very few people in Hawaii know about, but they should. It's the second Pearl Harbor. It took place on May 21st, 1944. And May 21st is coming soon, a couple of days away from us now. And uh, Dolores uh, Gutman, Steve Gutman, a long marriage and dedicated, defined by their activism in the community, but so many organizations. We don't have time. In, our, in, a, in a short show here to describe all the organizations and causes they have been working on together all these years. And I admire and commend them for their activities in that regard. Um, today, we're talking about Westlock, a very, very important story. story and I, I suggest that our viewers take notes on this because they may not know anything about what happened in Westlock. So the first question, Dolores, I put to you, why are you interested in what happened at Westlock? Oh, it was brought to my attention in 2009. I never heard of Westlock until um, um, the Navy called me and said that this is an event that you need to be uh, be part of your history here in Hawaii. That was my first knowledge of it, and I'm still learning. Quite remarkable. And Steve, I'd like to say to you, you know, when I was in the Coast Guard, I studied casualties. I investigated casualties, a number of them serious casualties uh, right on through casualties that were interesting to um, the presidency and Congress. However, nothing came close to the investigation. Nothing I've ever done came anywhere close to what happened at Westlock and all the investigations that happened and all the reports were made, including a book called The Second Pearl Harbor. Gene Eric Salaker wrote a book only a few years ago. And, um, you know, it was it was like classified information until the 60s or 70s. And for that reason, nobody knew about it. Nobody captured it. The reports were written for the Navy. It was all internal and classified. And finally, we have this dispositive book, which is on Amazon um, by Salaker. And, and, I, and I find it very interesting that he does what I would have done in the Coast Guard. He examines every single fact. The book is loaded with exactly what happened. So Steve, Make yourself a, a legal investigator now as a lawyer, then tell us in a few words what happened on May 21st, May 21st, 1944. Well, actually, Dolores does a better job of describing the, the incident, but um, and I really think we ought to have her go through it. Okay, I take your point. Dolores, you describe the incident. Well, the, the Second Pearl Harbor uh, really kind of skipped over some factors. He talked about the, the LS3, the LST uh, vessels in Pearl Harbor uh, and uh, those things, but he didn't talk about the incident itself in detail. He skipped over the fact that what happened actually there in terms of the explosion on LSC 353, which uh, were being unloaded by the 29th decontamination uh, unit from Schofield Barracks. And uh, the ship was overloaded, and they lost uh, uh, two, uh, two or three roll off uh, on LS-353 as it was maneuvered around Maui, uh, on Maui. And so the ship came back to Pearl Harbor to be reloaded. And as they were reloaded with no training or anything, uh, they, the explosion occurred in the afternoon. They arrived around 7 o'clock about over a hundred or so men from Schofield arrived at Pearl Harbor around seven o'clock to unload the uh, ship on the sun. That was a Sunday morning, May 21st, 44. And so that the, the secret part and the Navy uh, actually prefer not to talk about it because the men were not trained. And, uh, and the second day in the second event happened me on July 17th in the, at Port Chicago. These men were unloading ammunition and gasoline on this LST-353 that blew up, explosion. And the bodies were flown all over the place at the West, uh, uh, I mean, at Pearl Harbor. And uh, the body, many bodies are still, uh, the bones and everything is still down in, in the uh, Walker Bay. And we have a lot of history, and I have names of people that survived. And uh, we will talk about that on Friday, some of them. Well, tell us what's happening on Friday. 
On Friday, May the 20th, which is we're celebrating the 11th uh, anniversary of the West Lock and Turney's life and memory. And this began in 2010 at the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific. And there are 39 graves, unknown marked graves with body parts in them. They have to be, uh, to be analyzed by the POWMIA, which is the DPAA at Joint Base Pearl Harbor. So the celebration is to uh, memorialize those, those men that are buried there in unmarked graves, 39 of them. And it began at two o'clock on Friday, May the 20th. And it's about a 45 minutes to 60 minute uh, services. And it's a military protocol. And it's in collaboration, the Obama Hawaii and Africana Museum is uh, in working with, in collaboration with Joint Base, I mean, Joint Military Forces of Hawaii uh, to celebrate that. Okay, so there's an African American connection here. And yes. I want to explore that with you. There were 559 people injured or killed. Uh, something I recall, 136 well, were, were killed. Well, something similar they don't know exactly how many people because we only picked up body parts off the water, and uh, some of them were never recovered. I've gone down Joint Base Pearl Harbor with uh, different admirals and generals uh, for the last 10 years, and uh, I was I get more information every time I go with them down to in the back of the uh, high security area about this incident. And it's still unfolding. Yeah, there were a lot of reports written, and they're inconsistent in many ways. So we don't we don't know the whole story yet. The board of inquiry was initiated the very day after this happened. But one thing yeah, I'd like course. to I'd like to offer you is that there was an inconsistency as to the cause, uh, and there's an inconsistency as to why it was kept classified. Let me let me say what I mean. Um, there, there was some talk about a Japanese uh, submarine, a one-man submarine out there, I and mean, some investigation done on that, and the possibility that that you know that that caused the uh, the explosion. Um, the explosion was huge; it, it sank uh, six LSDs, and those are large ships, and yeah, those I'm ships sorry. were loaded with uh, with tanks and war material and mortar rounds, right. uh, three thousand tons of explosives on these right. six ships. Yes. And it really destroyed Westlock at the time, including structures on, on the beach. Um, in any event, uh, uh, the I guess the prevailing theory now is that the men were untrained, as you say. Yeah, there, well, there was, there was gasoline, yes. exposed gasoline, uh, and some fellow was smoking a cigarette, and the cigarette set off the gasoline, and the gasoline <laughs> set off the ammunition. Uh, I think there are probably other theories too. And there are multiple theories about why the Navy originally kept it secret. Um, this was part of a, a special um, a special project, delivering this ammunition to the Marianas uh, to clear the Marianas so they could fly a B-29 uh, into uh, over Tokyo. Um, and uh, so uh, they, they managed to get their act together only a day or two after by bringing oh, one other day. LS one day. Uh, okay. Bringing other LSTs in to do the same job, and they carried out the mission, the convoy, if you will, um, to the Marianas, uh, and it was uh, pretty successful. much on schedule, which is really a statement. But since this was a highly classified uh, mission, they didn't want to talk about it. Uh, yeah, and now uh, the, the state of Hawaii was still under martial law, and uh, because there was so much tension because of what was happening in Japan and their uh, planning to, you know, uh, invade uh, the Marietta Islands and to make a, a, a secret kind of an impact. But the, the uh, Japanese ships were out there from California and all around the Pacific and everything. So they had to be very careful. And so what happened is they, they needed to test some of the ship because they were overloaded. And we lost uh, three roll-off uh, LSCs. On there, those are the roll on on the LST, uh, the larger uh, uh, boat, and so that was why the army was, uh, you know, tasked with unloading and reloading LST 353 that blew up. And the reason they, the guys didn't know how to handle it, they were just rolling uh, live ammunition down uh, chutes where you know they just placing live ammunition on the thing and, and, and onto a truck. Uh, there were, I have some pictures that showing them doing that. And they don't have a clue about the danger. 
and also the gasoline that the tanks that are also on, on board. So it was easy. It was lots of um, ways that they, they you know, the, the explosion began. And it was just, uh, and when the ship blew up, it was just, it was, the people on it was just mesmerized, period. What do the pictures uh, show, Dolores? The, the picture the picture just shows LS-353 just into explosion and it's, and it's spattered all over Walker Bay and the uh, adjacent ships that were nestled together. That's how the sixth ship got, uh, uh, you know, uh, the fire on him. And then uh, one guy, which you will be seeing in our program on Friday, uh, his body was blown over on the uh, West Rock side, on the Wapio side of the thing, and they didn't find him till 10 days later. Other body parts, fingers and arms and, and all kinds of things were just picked up off the water. And then I talked to uh, another gentleman who worked in, in the uh, in the, in the uh, Navy Yard. He helped pick up some of the body parts uh, off the water. And then, they, and then people later on, even body parts were still laying all over a uh, joint base Pearl Harbor in, in 43, when this, I mean, 42 when this happened. So again, is they were deteriorating and that kind of thing. So, uh, and, and the Navy, uh, and it's okay, it's, it's historical. Port Chicago and West Rock uh, incidents were being had about uh, black men, which is the dirty work. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one thing I wanted to explore with you. Uh, of the people that were killed, uh, at least half of them uh, More were than black. Half. More than half. Yeah. But what are your numbers? What What is it, Steve? Well, the numbers, they have, they still, uh, uh, although POW MIH sent me a whole list of things and I've gotten another, some declassified information, they, the numbers vary all over the place. So they were able look, why, to... Why were there so many African-American men in such a dangerous job? Why, why was that? Because this is, uh, this is just the... This is just the tip of the iceberg. This was a, uh, the two incidents, the one at, well, uh, at Pearl Harbor on May 21st, 44, and, and Port Chicago, July uh, 17th, 1944. Those were the two events. There's another event also happened in the Marietta Islands, unloading the ships. Uh, that one, uh, we, I'm not talking about it at the moment. My researcher did work on that, but we're just talking about Pearl Harbor here. And that story is not real, and I'm not sure why that we have all the people that died because they have military uh, numbers. And the list that I have are number, military numbers and the families never heard from these people. And uh, more recently, um, I've been contacted. I'm, I don't know why I'm always being contacted on this. They did find a couple of people, uh, bodies at, uh, and names listed uh, in the last couple of years or so. That's a lot remember, of Jane, remember this whole time is this is when the service was still segregated. And this was grunt work. And the grunt work was frequently done by the African-Americans. Okay, that explains it, um, you know, in Port Chicago and in, in, in West Lock. Right, right. Yeah, and, and, and the difference with the Port Chicago was that could be seen actually in San Francisco. So they, they, the Navy couldn't put the, the secret tab, tabs on it like they did with, with West Lock. Um, here with the Marshall Law and everything else, they were able to to keep it under wraps. The real question is why did it stay labeled secret into the 60s? I mean, it's understandable why initially they did it, but it, it really should, should have been reported. Um, well, do you think, you think it, um, it was um, an intentional withholding of information from the public? Yes, they, yeah, it was, it, was just a, it could be just a mistake. Why would they have continued yeah, the uh, Because it was segregated, uh, it was a segregated military at the time. And NAACP was giving the uh, military a hard time in terms of um, uh, the positions of blacks in the serving in World War II, including uh, Tuskegee Airmen and uh, those people. And here in Hawaii, the uh, all of the the bases, all the rough work with the engineers, I think they're Corps of Engineers, they call themselves, the white officers, they were sent to uh, prepare the way in the area of the islands, and then the, the, the blacks would come in into her Pearl Harbor to pick up the pieces and to do all the grudge work uh, at Pearl Harbor that needed to be done. And they don't get credit for this. And the, and the, the second Pearl Harbor doesn't even deal with that that part of the story at all. No, as I read up on this, I, I thought to myself, this is a story that's basically unknown, uh, even here, even here in Hawaii, 
And it's very good that you are, you know, covering it, exposing it. And, uh, well, they have to, uh, you have to keep in mind that uh, Hawaii was under martial law and the, and the uh, Asian people in particular, because they didn't know a lot of uh, mainland people could not tell different ethnic groups of Asian ancestry. And uh, they were monitored day and night. Uh, and uh, the people, even today, when we also talk about the story, the capital with the, with the historic foundation, Hawaii Foundation, uh, a few years ago, people remember the incident, but they were not allowed to talk about it during World War II. They were not, the, the newspaper only had about uh, uh, a short uh, five or six lines about it. And the incident happened. They didn't even say what it was. Yeah, and I you got, can imagine. I got that document. You can imagine uh, how how uh, the Navy was affected by this. They were probably astounded that it happened in the first place. Uh, it was a major event in so many ways. It affected um, their whole um, their whole position uh, in the Pacific. <clears throat> um, they didn't want to talk about it. They gagged, made a gag order for the press here. They wouldn't mm -hmm. discuss it. At the same time, they galvanized themselves on two fronts to have a court of inquiry immediately look into it. And they, I think they were paranoid too. They thought that it was a yeah, they were. Japanese submarine. They, they couldn't clear that possibility. And at the same time, uh, they, they were afraid of public opinion about it. Right, exactly. Uh, and the narrow report uh, have the court of inquiry. I haven't seen that yet. Uh, and that, they talk about the court of inquiry to people that survived the incident and also more about the Navy. But that's research for future generations, not for me. <laughs> Steve, well, Steve, uh, what would you add to all of that? I mean, obviously, you're both interested in this. You're both working on it, so to speak, uh, advancing, you know, public knowledge about it. Uh, what's your point of view? Well, actually, I would like to talk a little more about the memorial service that's really on Friday and the fact that um, I think it's really important if, if people can uh, be present and 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 and, and celebrate the, the lives of these, of these people um, because partly there's there's so many of them that we really don't don't have names and it, it's really it's really sad uh, in terms of what occurred. Yeah, that's one of the points in, in what you published on the event um, to give them names because my recollection, of course, the numbers are not settled, but uh, there were 29 body parts uh, found. They couldn't find any bodies because the explosion was so violent series of explosions i should say um <clears throat> i mean six six uh, lsds blew up with ammunition of three thousand tons of ammunition including mortar rounds artillery <clears throat> so that uh, there was really nothing left of anyone and the 29 body parts were buried uh, but at the time there was no technology to determine what belonged to who uh, and you alluded, Dolores, to the possibility that they can now find out uh, using modern technology. Are they yeah. putting names on these graves? Is that what's happening? Well, right now, they, they, they have to untomb the 39 body parts up there. That, that is one of the things that they, uh, uh, the POWMIA office have to do here at Pearl Harbor. They have, we have talked about it, that they need to do that so they can identify uh, those body parts. Uh, they can identify some name if the several families have come forth, both black and white, uh, and given their names, and they were able to track. This is POW MIA office was able to track their names down and find them, and they are listed in the National Cemetery. These are just names that don't have anything to do with the body part. Uh, so that's the second uh, thing that has to be done so that the families, this has been 78 years ago. The families have never heard from their family members again. And we, you, you notice that I said 39 graves with body parts in them, not bodies, not bodies, because the, they, they, were, they were blown to the smithering uh, when LS-334 and the closest to LS-350 also uh, exploded with the same uh, the NASA tenacity as the LS-353. So you have a conglomerate here, and a lot of people, it's just your word, his word, and their word. Uh, we're still unfolding the story. So the, the best that we are going to get for the, uh, uh, in this research has, we have to look at the Court of uh, Inquiry reports and how they well, I hope you I hope you talk about this book, The Second Pearl Harbor by Jean Eric uh, Selector. It's actually 
um, on Amazon. And you can get yeah, it. Yeah, I, 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 I have a, a separate, he sent me, a, I talked to the guy, he sent me a song. The only part, as I said, he was not interested in the, in the African-American piece of it. He wasn't interested in talking about segregation. Mm. And you know, the army was only desegregated in, in 1948. So you, you're dealing with a lot of, uh, uh, of history that, that, that well, do, you, do, you think, do you think that what happened at, at Westlock uh, led to the desegregation in 1948? No, I'm not obvious, saying, no, I'm not obvious... saying that. No, I'm not saying that. But, the, but you have to re kind of think about how our country was, uh, you know, segregated. Jim Crow was, was evident everywhere. And, and this including the, the workers in the factories that have to build the aircraft while the men are at war. And, and, and how the migration came to the West to help work in the factories. So there are many uh, uh, pieces of this story that helps to tell a larger narrative. And, uh, and the best I can talk about Hawaii is because that history is under the radar. The people don't talk about what they did here at all. And in, at, in, in Pearl Harbor, Pearl City, Kwanzaa 33 was part of Manana Barracks. And uh, I don't know, uh, uh, another base that was black uh, barracks were outside of uh, Fort Chapter. This is uh, our Navy historian, Je uh, uh, Jeff Dodge, told me about. They, they just dismantled that one altogether like they did the ones in, in the Ever Beach, Ever, Ever side. So, a lot of the history is still on the radar. They're dealing with Pearl Harbor and here in, in Hawaii. I understand, but this is not just a, 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 a lesson in history, although it is a very interesting lesson. Uh, I, I hate to say this, but it could make a very uh, interesting movie, for example, to cover it in detail. Uh, I'm not sure there's a lot of information or uh, people that can give the details aside what's written in these reports. Um, but. Uh, I think there's lessons to be learned beyond the historical rendition and analysis. And uh, I'd like to ask you guys to, to talk about that. Uh, Steve, what can we learn as we learn about what happened here in Westlock? What can we learn for the future, uh, for Hawaii, for the military, um, for, I don't know, race relations? Well, as far as the, the actual incident itself, but just in terms of the importance of, of training, and the fact that the people were, were not properly trained um, certainly led to the numbers increasing. The mere fact that the explosion occurred would have led to a fair number of deaths, but it got compounded by the fact that people really didn't know um, what to be doing initially in terms of how to react and, 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 and address the problem as it was developing. Dolores? Well, I, I think that uh, they, what we need to do is continue. I'm working with a, a historian, uh, and he will be at our uh, services on, on Friday. Uh, we're looking at how to mitigate the situation and tell these, uh, this particular part of the story. Uh, we're, working, we're, we're looking at, I think, at North Base Pearl Harbor. They want it on the West Stock side. They're looking at dismantling a wharf over there. And but we need to do something to make sure that our young people, our future generation, uh, know about this particular one so that they can also be able to prevent such a things occurring again, incidents, no matter what they are. So it, history informs the future. So I think here in Pearl Harbor, since the, the World War II began here, it is very imperative that we tell a larger narrative about all of the people that work, that participate in World War II in the Pacific. The World, the World War II in the Pacific story has not been told adequately at all, which includes the people of African descent. Uh, the Japanese, uh, because they did so well in um, World War II in Europe, they, they, they stand out. But the Filipinos and the Chinese and the, the Hawaiians and African Americans, our story here in the Pacific are not told well. And we need, his, we need uh, uh, scholars, and researchers to unfold that story. And like you said, uh, uh, a documentary will be really uh, well done if they look at the whole story, not piecemeal it. Well, the other thing about this, uh, and it, it goes especially now in the time of Ukraine and the violence in, uh, in Ukraine, is we, we forget just how war goes. We forget the violence. We forget 
how dangerous it is to handle oh, ammunition. Oh. 3,000 tons of ammunition. Um, you know, it's easy for something like this to happen, just as in Port Chicago of San Francisco. Exactly. All, all these 60 days before. Uh, so it, it's, really, it's really a lesson in making us understand about war, about, about the, the, the lethal consequences of even innocent, relatively innocent acts of, of loading a barge. Um, and I, I don't think people understand that. We, we've been, um, you know, we've been sort of cauterized about exactly. the violence. We yes. have, we've heard it all, uh, you know, Pearl Harbor. We've seen the pictures of the ships uh, smoking and sinking and what have you. And, 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 you know, and look at the Arizona Memorial and all this. But the fact yeah. is that, that, you know, we don't fully appreciate the violence of what happened. And exactly. the deaths surrounding us and the body. Uh, and I, this, uh, uh, this is a factor which is prevalent, uh, very prevalent that we can talk about after the COVID and the pandemic. We need to talk about the real story of war, especially looking at Ukraine and what's happening there. And that that situation is not any different than happening in World War II here in, Pacific, here in Hawaii and across uh, the Pacific Islands and also Europe. And uh, again, is I think that it requires us to have a dialogue, and I think that would be a nice program to have to actually talk about it, that we have it from different sectors and people from different sectors to talk about it in, in terms of how war, war has impacted our lives and we need to, what we need to kind of start looking at for the future generation to kind of minimize this and mitigate it in some way. Uh, because war is not, it, it, it is not acceptable, and and a lot of too many innocent people died, by the way, and and and, and there can we get along otherwise? And I think we need to uh, be at the table to actually talk about it. one thing that that COVID has done and the pandemic crisis. <clears throat> I think now pro con, it can bring us together to have a conversation. Yep. Well, and the and the great tragedy is in war, in the fog of war, um, terrible things happen to people. They lose their lives, and that is that is something every time. And as they say, you know, the the history is told by the survivors, but the people who were killed, they don't have a chance to tell. They don't it. have. They don't have a voice. And we are. That's why the twenty, the May twentieth at the National Cemetery, we're that voice, yeah. and we need to try to try to. Uh, uh, mitigate it in some way to, to so it doesn't happen again, yeah. so that they do have a voice. And I thank you for inviting us on the show to talk about that. This is the beginning of a long, a longer narrative that that should take place on your show and other uh, media. And yes, well, we that. we want it. We want to cover this. We want people to be fully informed and thoughtful about it. So, Steve, let me ask you: Have we covered the points that you would have liked to? See us cover today. Is there anything you want to add in terms of um, you know what we should take from this discussion? No, I think um, you, you've covered the, the primary primary points. Um, I mean, it's a, it's an incident that um, it happened. It, it it can easily happen again, um, and it's uh, it's something that that people need to uh, need to say their proper proper prayers for. Yeah, sometimes I think Hawaii doesn't think of its history in the comprehensive way that you guys are talking about. And we have to be mindful of history or we will repeat it. Um, and uh, so I think it's very valuable that you're um, bringing this to public attention. Well, you know, the other thing though, Ray Emery, who just died last year, he was that voice before. He was he, it was a one-man show, and he worked at it uh, ferociously until he died. And he was, uh, actually, he was my anchor and then put the wind, the wind beneath my wing to get involved in this project. And he would not let me walk away with it. But he gave me all of the support to tell the story and for him, uh, uh, making sure that the unknown people that died on, the, on uh, December the 7th, 41, that their lives were meaningful and, and that we shouldn't forget them. And so the same thing uh, uh, happened, he said, and he was in uh, court when uh, May 21st, uh, 44, the incident occurred. So he, he witnessed it. You know, um, you know, part of Think Tech's um, approach to things is to make people, uh, to take people 
beyond their their daily lives, their daily grind, their, you know, whatever they do on a given day, take them out of their comfort zones, to yeah. try to give them a world view, uh, not only about the, the present, but about the past. And I think that um, if you want to, if you want to understand Hawaii right down to the core, you have to understand things like this too. It has yes. to be in our historical lexicon. It has to be yes. things we think about and we build into our worldview or at least our Hawaii view. So I uh, thank you very much for this discussion. And uh, Dolores and Steve, I really appreciate you coming around. Thank um, you. Good for you and I, and I wish you a, a, a productive event uh, here coming up soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jay. Really appreciate it. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.